London is facing an architectural crisis that could last for 300 years. Strong words, can I back it up? Now, this is the Gherkin. It's a building in the center of London made of glass and as you can tell, it looks a bit like a Gherkin. But if you think that this is somehow a nice building, you're wrong. This colossal gold glass phallus that was seemingly just thrown up and vomited into existence was built as if the designers thought if they could build a building big enough that they could somehow spunk their way to the moon. London is starting to not look out of place if you plonked it in the middle of Abu Dhabi, which isn't surprising when you find out where most of these buildings come from. Stay tuned to find that out. Unfortunately, London is littered with these monstrosities. You only need to walk 10 yards away from the Gherkin and you bump into this abortion of a building. And this is a place that's supposed to contain art. If you told me this was a North Korean concentration camp, I would not bat an eyelid. I mean, for God's sake, I've seen more life-affirming things in a morgue. Tower blocks also scar the London skyline like huge pimples on the face of a very attractive lady. These concrete block Lego sets contain what we call poor people. We're still here in this council-built Lego set. <laughs> They're cubicles for the working class plebs. Think of it from our business point of view, eh? I mean, this flat is in a wonderful position, isn't it? I mean, it's 15 minutes from the West End, it's 15 minutes from the motorway, and 15 minutes from the Grand. Parisians, that means people from Paris. They had the right idea. They were so outraged when they saw this being erected in 1959 that only two years later, anything over seven stories was banned. I mean, it's a bit of a running joke about that building. The only good thing about it is the view. Look at New York. It does have more skyscrapers than London. However, it also has more order. Whereas London has no order. It's complete chaos. The skyline looks so chaotic, it's as if they've asked a six-year-old to design it on Sim City. The former City of London planning officer told BBC TV that London was becoming a victim of homogenised international architecture that is out of scale with its surroundings, damaging the London skyline and giving a very bad impression to people who visit London. I can hear you now, in your brain you're thinking, God, why do you even care anyway? And I was born here, that gives me more right than anybody. That's it for the Only Fools and Horses clips now. It is immoral. Oh, shut up, you tart. <laughs> I lied. When these buildings were vomited into existence, with very little public approval, by the way, they always had a nickname attached to them. Something owing to the design. The razor, the shard, the walkie-talkie, the onion, the cheese grater, the stealth bomber. And have you noticed, none of those names are nice. I mean, gherkins are those horrible little green things you pick out of McDonald's burgers. A shard of glass is something you actively avoid unless you want to bleed to death. Same with the razor. And at a push, the cheese grater, unless you're an absolute sadist. I mean, it's almost as if they're trying to make London sound like the most inhospitable place on earth. Like a fatal version of Takeshi's fucking castle or something. Now this is City Hall, often called The Onion, because it's so bad it makes you want to cry. Sometimes called The Armadillo. Some of these names sound like 1960s East End gangsters and villains. Tony the Razor, Armadillo Harry, Charlie Cheese Grater. Come anywhere near us and we'll do ya. Everything seems to be named after something that can hurt you or something you can eat. Sums up London pretty nicely, really. What about this? Nicknamed The Pringle. It's the 2012 London Olympic cycling track. Pringles are actually very Moorish, unlike watching cycling. In fact, I'd go further. I'd say I don't like watching cycling, cycling, or cyclists. All of those things are as boring as listening to the explanation by the architects about why they designed the velodrome to look like a Pringle. The success of this project firmly is rooted in the engagement and commitment of the design team in an integrated design process, absolutely fundamental. The velodrome is the biggest venue that was run as a competition. I think it was about 70 teams that... So it's integrated holistic design, clever teamwork, and uh, that's what you can achieve. So that's why you made it look like a Pringle. The people that designed these are architectural terrorists, ego pricks. I think the people that are responsible for designing these buildings deserve to be thrown off the tallest one that they designed. I'm not advocating violence at all. They'll be completely fine anyway. They'll bounce off the pavements like bouncy castles owing to their huge inflated egos. But wait for it, because these are not even the worst designed buildings in London. Not even as bad as this, the Wobbly Bridge. The bridge opened on the 10th of June, 2000. 
attracting thousands of people and the media. But as the people poured over the bridge, it was clear something was wrong. The bridge was wobbling from side to side. Tell you what we should do with that. It's often said, and I quote, a society grows great when old men plant trees in which the shade they shall never sit in. Unfortunately, with all the massive buildings in London now, doesn't matter where you go, you usually are in shade. Mind you, that is if the building doesn't try and kill you. Unlike the walkie-talkie, it's something that was last fashionable in the 1980s. It's now one of the biggest buildings in London. The walkie-talkie gets its name from its designers making it concourse, which basically means they made it bend a bit. If we're gonna face architectural design around things that were fashionable in the 80s, what next? The answering machine, the Sony Walkman, Whoopi Goldberg. The traditional architecture you see behind me, there have been lots of ambitious skyscrapers in recent years, most of them commissioned during the property boom. You've heard of the Shards, you may have heard of the Gherkin, you may have heard of the Cheese Grater, and up here is what's become known as the Walkie Talkie. 38 storeys tall, costing more than 200 million pounds, it flares outwards at the top to maximise the rent. The rent's higher in the upper floors, but that has a problem associated with it. As any Boy Scout knows, as any Boy Scout knows, as any Boy Scout knows, if you have a curved mirror and you concentrate the light from the sun, you can set fire to something. Cool. A building designed like a magnifying glass, symbolically torturing all the poor little ants underneath it. If you have a curved mirror and you concentrate the light from the sun, you can set fire to something. You're going to need a lot more lip balm than that when you're being torched to death, love. Now this is curved and it's meant that the light and the heat is focused on a point down here, just below the building. And this is the sort of effect that has. You can scorch a carpet, nearly setting fire to it at this local hairdresser on East Cheap. And have a look here on the side, the paint has bubbled up from the heat. Even the products inside the window have been affected. That's a plastic lemon. You can see the bubbles on it. Serves them right for having a plastic fucking lemon in the window. Why do they have a plastic lemon in the window? I don't know, but I bet they're bitter. Come and get cooked to death by the latest abortion of a building so bad you'd have thought it had been designed by this guy. The Death Star will be completed on schedule. Making a building that can slice you in half with its laser beams like you're a rotisserie chicken as you scurry to work. As any Boy Scout knows, as any Boy Scout knows, doing the same as me. Admiring the view before they turn it all into glass and steel. Hate to waste a view. It's a good one. Yeah. It's a good one because you can't see the shard or the gherkin or the walkie-talkie. I thought you were going back out on active service. It's not called that. It, we're key workers and anyway I'm not even a key worker. If it helps, I feel a lot safer. <laughs> You cheeky bastard. So you're a fan of all this modern architecture then, are you? Just the opposite. Good to know. Anyway, I'm off. Don't forget to clap for the NHS in ten minutes. <laughs> Postmodern relativism. This is a big arty bollocks word, and the plonkers that usually define themselves as one of these has usually come straight out of some trendy art college. And they usually say dumb things like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, beauty is subjective, art can be anything. And you love it, don't you? You lap up their bullshit like you've been told it's the tastiest thing since Pop-Tarts. Now this is incredibly useful to the money men, because it means that they can call anything beautiful, and you have to let them get away with it, because that's their opinion, and how dare you challenge it, you Nazi! But there's just one tiny little problem with that. What was that, term? It was bollocks. <laughs> I mean, we all know artists are the most insufferable fuckers on the planet. Doing research for this video didn't take me long at all to find some of the bollocks that they like to talk. 1959 is uh, 
Good God, I'd hate to see his worst. It's, uh, it has, uh, well, it's very rich. It has all of the uh, composition that, that most, uh, most all paintings have. And, uh, yeah, in as much as it has some paint on a canvas. It's very uh, complicated composition. And then I, I also use the sides with the, the uh, I don't know that you can see that, but there's orange on the one side and then the other side is very active uh, visually. Visually active? I'll tell you what this reminds me of. No, sir, that's not supposed to be vomit. It's dabs of light. No, it's vomit. <laughs> yes. It's uh, one of my best. <laughs> I could paint something better than that if you cut both my arms off. In fact, I'm fairly sure I've seen an elephant paint a better picture than that. Tell you what though, if I could paint a picture in a couple of minutes by just chucking a load of white paint on a canvas and selling it for $20 million, I'd be talking out my ass as well. That video was six minutes long. It was like watching paint dry, which incidentally is the focus of his next exhibition. Now how does this link to modern architects? This kind of obscure language and makes you feel like you're stupid if you don't understand it is how they bamboozle you. Now what this does is it gives property developers free reign to do whatever they like. They can throw up any old crappy building and say that it's subjective. Art can be anything. But here's the thing, we all know that's rubbish. Just because you can build these things don't mean you should. I could bash that man's face in with a golf club, but I won't. It's the same reason that I never hear anybody ever say I had a lovely holiday in Birmingham. And why not? Because it's an ugly shithole. But you do hear plenty of people saying we just got back from a lovely holiday in Bath, Prague, Rome, Paris. This dumbass has written a book about how to love brutalism. God, what's his next book? How to love a child molester? To be fair, I think Vice News has probably got that one covered. I think that people naturally love traditional architecture, whereas you need to be taught how to love this crap. These are the sort of things the ordinary general public would say. The bloody idiots. These buildings put London on the map. From what I could tell, I thought London was already firmly on the map. Yeah, yeah, there it is, look, just down the bottom of the UK. Found it. The thing about these buildings is, it's very good for tourism. Let me ask you this, where do tourists first go when they visit London? Do they go up the Shard, walk around the walkie-talkie, marvel at the Gherkin? No, they go to Buckingham Palace, Leicester Square, Trafalgar Square, St Paul's Cathedral. Google it. This is good for business. It brings thousands of jobs to the capital. I mean, that's all well and good. I get that. Jobs are important. But if it's only just about what's good for jobs, why don't we just have skyscrapers everywhere? Let's have three in Norwich, couple in Exeter, five in Hull. That is how they get away with it. Now for the last part. Who is building them? Let's cut to the chase here. London is a tax haven for the criminally wealthy. You know it, I know it, they know it, we all know it. Russian, Chinese, Arab money flows through London faster than the Thames. London is the world capital money launderer. I wish it wasn't so, but wishing it wasn't so doesn't make it untrue. Just ask Father Christmas. People make wishes to him all the time for stuff they want. And do they get it? Of course they don't. He's a bastard. Did you know, for instance, that Qatar money owns more of London than the Queen of England? Follow the money and you find the cause. Bang. Wallop. What a video. You are a mother flipping G, do you know why? Because you are in the watch till the end club. Click the like button if you agree with this video. Comment below with your favorite city. And if you wanna be a great mother flipping son of a gun, go ahead and subscribe. Or not, I don't care, do what you like. Make your own decisions.